Father, I thank you for this day, and we thank you for the opportunity to read your word. And uh, we're thankful, Lord, for literary masterpieces in your in your scripture, uh, so that when we read the word, we're we're um, we're not just reading the words of men, but the words of God, and they are the best. And Lord, I pray that you help us as we read this story of Ruth to enjoy every aspect of it, and also, Lord, to benefit and and uh, to grow from the truth revealed in it. And this morning specifically, I pray that you would guide my uh, preaching and, and what I'm going to speak and guide our understanding and use this, your word, to transform our lives, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, Johann Goethe said that in the book of Ruth, we have, we have nothing so lovely in the whole range of epic and idyllic poetry. And I think his assessment was absolutely correct. The story of Ruth begins with Naomi, who she goes to Moab. She follows her husband there, Naomi and Elimelech and Malon and Chilion. Um, and there in, in uh, Moab, avoiding a famine, but her husband Elimelech dies. And then her sons marry two women, not Jewish women, but Moabite women. And after they marry those women, Orpah and Ruth, her sons also died. And so we're left to see three desolate and heartbroken widows whose dreams have been absolutely crushed. But finally, good news arrives from home. And after 10 years in Moab, Naomi gets word that the famine in Bethlehem and in Judah has ended. And so Naomi, she has nothing there in Moab to keep her, no family um, and no possessions to speak of. She decides to return home where she does have an inheritance. And so Ruth and Orpah, her daughters-in-law, they must have formed some kind of a tight family bond, and they determined to go with Naomi. But in a surprising conversation, a conversation that really just shocks us as Christians to read, uh, Naomi tries to talk them out of coming back with her. She tries to convince them to turn back and to return to their families and return to their homes and to their culture and to their gods. Why does Naomi do that? Well, she wanted these poor young widows to find husbands. And, and if they could remarry, their desolation, their poverty um, would have ended. And they would have someone to provide for them and someone to protect them. And Naomi... Um, kind of understood conventional wisdom was that if Moabite women came with her back to Israel, they were probably not going to find husbands there. Uh, and so Naomi says this to her daughters-in-law in chapter 1 and verse 8, and Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Now, Naomi had become a bitter person. We found that out uh, a couple weeks ago, and she believed that God was against her, and she blamed God for her sorrows, stating that she had gone out of Bethlehem full, and God had brought her back again empty. And so Naomi, in her bitterness, seems to think that Ruth and Orpah could find better protection in the house of a pagan husband than she could or than they could um, in the refuge found in the Lord. Orpah was convinced. Naomi made a good speech, and Orpah, who originally wanted to come with her, kisses Naomi goodbye. She turns around, and she goes home, but not Ruth. Ruth refused to leave Naomi's side, and so Ruth did leave her family and her culture and her country and her gods. She left them behind her in Moab, and she returned with Naomi to Bethlehem 
and it was at the time, the beginning of barley harvest. With the death of her husband and her sons, Naomi's financial prospects were ruined in her 10 years of absence. She owned land that was in her family under Elimelech's name, but she had no means to plant that land or to harvest it, and so she's probably going to have to sell that land. Anyway, she and Ruth have precious little to eat when they arrive back in Bethlehem. So after some period of time, I don't know how long, not long at all, but Ruth um, and Naomi get up in the morning and Ruth looks at Naomi and says, hey, let me go glean in the fields. Now, gleaning was an Israelite form of welfare and the poor of the land, the widows, the fatherless, the poor were allowed to follow the reapers in the field and just basically pick up whatever was left behind. And also the Old Testament law required that uh, farmers not reap the very corners of their field that would be left for the poor, the widows, the far fatherless. And so this was menial work. It was humiliating. It was difficult. But what a lovely woman was Ruth. She humbled herself to the lowest level. Out of lo loyalty to Naomi, she went to the fields to glean and to work hard for both of them. And no doubt, Ruth was a beautiful woman. And on her first day in the field, she catches the eye of Boaz, the field's owner, the owner of the particular field that she just happened to, to be in. And he asked about her, and he found out who she was. And then Boaz approached Ruth and spoke kindness to her. He wanted her to stay in his fields and not go to any other. Um, he instructed his reapers not to harass her or to embarrass her. And, he, and when she was thirsty, Boaz provided so that she could drink from the water that was provided to her to, or to his uh, designated hire, hired workers. But Ruth knew her place. She wasn't just an impoverished widow needing charity. She was a foreigner. She was a Moabite. And she was from pagan lands. And so astonishment knocked her breath away when Boaz spoke to her. So she falls down at his feet and Ruth's words were barely audible. Why do you show such favor to a woman such as me? I'm a foreigner. Now Ruth is clueless at this point. I think she could not imagine that the man at whose feet she had fallen already loved her. When Boaz answered her question, why favor me? He spoke the most important concept in the whole story. Boaz had heard of Ruth's virtues, her loyalty to Naomi, but the greatest impression that she made on Boaz is found in chapter 2 and verse 12. And Boaz says, the Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Ruth had forsaken everything that she knew that, that could offer her protection back in the land of Moab, and she had uh, run to the Lord, run under his wings, and found refuge. And that's what mattered most. Boaz loved it, and God would honor it. So, so closes the scene in which Boaz speaks to Ruth in the field to which God had directed them both. They go each to their separate areas of work after this conversation, and Boaz probably to managing uh, whatever is going on with the reapers and planning things out, and Ruth goes to her gleaning, and hours pass, and the day is hot, and the sun is, is bright, in the, its height in the sky, and the work is steady, and I wonder what's going through Ruth's head at this point. She knows by this point, that Boaz has singled her out, and she knows that he has taken a special interest in her, but does she know why? Does she notice that she is involuntarily smiling and being embarrassed, try to suppress that smile? Perhaps she scolds herself. Perhaps she tells herself that she has no business feeling what she felt when he spoke to her. Maybe she doesn't know how she's supposed to feel, but some things are certain. For one, the hours certainly are, are not so heavy anymore. The work is easier. The burden of the day has become a rather pleasant burden as long as she's in his field. So Ruth 
stoops to pick up some grain and notices that she has been unconsciously humming a lovely tune. We do not have to wonder what's going through Boaz's mind during these hours. As we uh, come to our main text today, Boaz is just going to tell us plainly what he's thinking. The scenery changes slightly. Boaz has a meal now prepared for his hired workers. The foreman blows a trumpet to announce that work is going to cease for a while for a break. And as the workers find their seats near the near or at the table or whatever is spread out there for, the, I don't know if they spread a blanket or if they had a table, but they are finding their seats where the meal is prepared. The gleaners, while the workers are doing that, the gleaners are filing out of the field to fend for themselves. And Ruth is among them until a voice arrests her steps. It is the voice of Boaz calling her name. And we find this in Ruth chapter 2 and verse 14. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece in the, in, of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Also let grain from the bundles fall purposefully for her. Leave it that they may glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Then she took, took it up and went into the city, and, uh, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today, and where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law, whom she, with whom she had worked, and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, He said to me, You shall, not, you shall stay close by my young men until you have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women and that, she, and that the people do not meet you in any other field. So she stayed, and she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. You know, the old King James Version reads, uh, gives a rather obscure phrase in this passage, but it's a very memorable one, one that's always uh, stood out in my memory. That's in verse 16. And let fall also some handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. Handfuls of purpose. Now, we wouldn't say today handfuls of purpose. You can't hold purpose in like a handful, uh, but that... Uh, that's not a mistake. It's just a different way of speaking from years ago. But we would say it maybe more accurately, handfuls on purpose. Uh, drop some handfuls of grain, he's telling, telling them, on purpose for her. Boaz told his workers to leave that in Ruth's path. And as a result, Ruth brought home much more than Naomi had expected to see. And Naomi noticed and when she noticed, Naomi pronounced a blessing that was not just true for her and for Ruth, but it's true for every child of God. In Ruth chapter 20 and, or 2 and verse 20, uh, she said, Blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. What a true statement. Um, the Lord has not and I had, will not ever forsake his kindness. I want to focus on that statement for the remainder of our time this morning. Let us look at these words and learn about the Lord. Specifically, I want to learn this principle. God never forsakes his kindness to those who trust in him. God is faithful, and those who believe in him, those who trust in the Lord, will find him ever true and ever good and ever kind. God never forsakes his kindness to those 
who trust in him. And, you know, sometimes it may seem like he has forsaken his kindness. Naomi certainly felt that earlier in this story, but she has come to realize that that was just a feeling. And the truth is, God never forsook his kindness to her. This principle dawned on Naomi when she saw what Ruth had brought home. Do you remember how bitter Naomi had been before? She says in, in chapter 1, verse 20, she came to them, she said to them, Don't, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full and the Lord brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Naomi means pleasant. Since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. She said, call me Mara. Mara means bitter. Um, Naomi did not b stop believing in God. Uh, she, she didn't lose her faith. She just, she did not turn away from following the Lord, but she did not follow him very well. Does that make sense? Sometimes I find myself in that same boat. I don't turn my back on God, but I don't follow him as well as I should. And she did not stop believing in God. In fact, she was angry at God and could only imagine that the Lord was against her. She trusted that God is righteous, but forgot that God was good. But here is the amazing thing about grace. God is kind, even when we are not. He is patient and good, even when we do not follow him well. Now, it did not take much to jar Naomi back to her, out of her melancholy, to bring her back out of this bitterness. She suddenly exclaims this truth of God, blessed be the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. She is suddenly proclaiming not, not the Lord's bitter treatment of her, but his kindness to her and even his kindness to her dead family members. But for now, let's just focus on that one word, kindness. What does that word specifically mean? Well, kindness translates a Hebrew word called hesed, or you're supposed to say that with a kind of a ch in it, but I can't do that. So, But we'll just call it hesed because I don't want to uh, spit all over the microphone. But uh, anyway, hesed is a very important word in the Bible and especially in the Old Testament. It's a key Old Testament term that indicates faithfulness to a specific relationship, especially a covenant relationship. It means to show kindness um, and to act in a loyal, loving way toward a person. And this is true of kindness in human relationships and of the kindness that God shows toward us. God's love moves him to be kind to those with whom he has established a covenant relationship. And so this word hesed, um, it, um, it is invoked when God enters into a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God had chosen Israel, making a covenant with them personally through Moses. Um, and then God enters personally into a covenant with any person that trusts in him. Naomi and her family had not followed the Lord perfectly, but they did trust in him. And Ruth also trusted in the Lord coming out of Moab to be under his wings. Now Naomi realizes it seemed dark for a while, but the Lord has not been unfaithful to his covenant. He has not forsaken kindness to herself or to Ruth or even to Elimelech or Malan and Chilion. God never forsakes his kindness because he is faithful to those who trust in him. The psalmist expresses it this way. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. That word translated mercy is the word hesed, the same word that we find translated kindness in our text. God's covenant kindness endures forever. His mercy endures forever. His mercy is an expression of his kindness to us. He never forsakes us. He never forsakes his mercy to us. God never forsakes his kindness because he is able to save those who trust in him God is able because he is sovereign and you can't miss the sovereignty of God if you read the book of Ruth with open eyes you might say um, <clears throat> excuse me a second yeah uh, you might say Ruth took action she volunteered to glean in the fields good things happen because Ruth made them happen 
But there were many fields in and around Bethlehem. Who directed Ruth into the field in which she just happened to meet Boaz? Well, God did. What if she had gone into the wrong field? Well, the results may have been disastrous, but unforeseen circumstances do not exist in the sovereign God's purview. He controls all things, and because God is sovereign, nothing can overpower him and force him to fail in his kindness. And so Naomi's exclamation of praise and, and, and joy sets before us an essential principle, and that is that God never forsakes his kindness to those who trust in him. Now, what does this principle tell us to do? What can we do with this if we believe this? And I believe we, we do believe this, that God never forsakes his kindness to those who trust in him. And since we believe this, what do we do about it? Well, the first thing we need to do is just trust God's kindness. Yes, you trust the Lord, but trust in his kindness. Run under his wings for refuge and trust God's offer of the free gift, eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. God's kindness is available and he will bring it to you in his new covenant kindness. Ruth trusted God's kindness. She left everything behind that would pull her away from trusting the Lord. And uh, she expressed it this way to Naomi. Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Ruth put her faith and her trust in the Lord and found refuge under his wings. Have you trusted the Lord for your refuge to save you from your sins? The Bible says, of course, that we're all sinners falling short of God's glory. The Bible teaches that when, we, when we're sinners, we're enemies of God and that we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's what it means to be saved, to be saved from the wrath of God. May it turn from friends to, uh, or from enemies to friends um, of God. And so when you trust in Jesus Christ, um, you, you are reconciled to God, and he will save you and give you everlasting life. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's why John 3.16 is so important. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, should not perish in the wrath of God, but have everlasting life life. The gospel is clear and Jesus is God's son who died, was buried and rose again for our sins. And when we trust him, we have his salvation. John 6 37 speaks of the kindness of God this way. All that the father gives me, this is Jesus talking, all that the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. In other words, if you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he will not reject you. He will enter into a new covenant with you. His hesed, his kindness will always be yours. And God will never forsake that. God never forsakes his kindness to those who trust in him. So trust in God's kindness. Also, you should express God's kindness. Express God's kindness. Since you have trusted and experienced God's kindness, you can be a conduit of it. Channels of God's blessing. Be God's blessing to someone else. God can do this without human instruments. He, he is, does not require us to do anything. Uh, and sometimes he does do this without us. But God loves to work through human means. He gives us a job to do. God wants you to be a channel of his loving kindness to others. And we find this expression of God's kindness first in Ruth herself. She shows that covenant loyalty that hesed to Naomi and Ruth selflessly goes out to glean in the fields I don't know if Naomi was incapable of that because of her age or if Ruth just says hey you know what you've had a hard life I'm going to go out and do this but she goes into the fields to support both herself and Naomi this is loyalty this is hesed but our text features a heavy dose of God's kindness expressed through the character Boaz. And Boaz 
expressed God's kindness to Ruth two times in this short narrative that we are covering today. He talks to her and expresses God's kindness at mealtime uh, and then after the meal in the field. At mealtime, Boaz shows special favor to Ruth. First, he calls her a foreign and destitute widow who was a gleaner and, and not someone in his employ. He calls her uh, to eat with him and the reapers. And so Ruth, if you can imagine, hears her voice. She turns around. She approaches the table or the blanket, whatever is spread out there. She approaches that timidly, I'm sure, still wondering at the attentions of Boaz. And I can just see Boaz motioning to her and showing her where he wants her to sit. And when she is seated, Boaz sits down near her. I don't know if he's right next to her, but he is near her. He's close enough to talk to her and to pass her so much food that she needed a doggy bag when the meal was over. And so here's, here's uh, the mealtime inter interaction. Now Boaz said to her in verse 14, at mealtime, come here and eat bread and, dr and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her. And she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. As the meal drew to a close, Ruth got up and left the table. Boaz and his reapers were still sit sitting there and they maybe watch her walk away. And, and then Boaz breaks the silence and he commanded his men. He said, you, you see this Moabite woman over here. You see Ruth. And uh, what I want you to do is mark her and and uh, I want you to drop extra grain in her path and be sure to never say anything contrary to her. Don't make her ashamed. Don't, don't make her feel bad about this. Uh, and, and even let her come and glean even amongst where, where you're reaping and, and so that she can get even more. And so he says this in verses 15 and 16. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. Also let uh, grain from the bundles fall purposefully for her. Leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. Those are the most favorable circumstances possible for Ruth. And under these favorable circumstances, she labors until the sun is going down and the reapers are headed home out of the field. And she takes her grain and she threshed it and she took home an ephah of barley. Now, how much is an ephah of barley? There's a lot of speculation about that. We don't know exactly. Uh, the consensus seems to be 30 pounds of barley. Uh, at whatever it was, at any rate, the idea that we're supposed to get is not necessarily how much it weighs, but how much it is, relatively speaking. In other words, a lot, all right? More than she normally should have had. And so when Ruth arrived home, exhausted and sweaty, but carrying herself happily, she showed Naomi what she had gleaned. And then... Ruth pulls out her doggy bag of leftovers from lunch and gave that to Naomi, showing once again her expression of hesed, the loving kindness of God. Naomi, after she picked up her jaw off the ground and her eyes were as big as saucers, she has questions. Where did you go today? She said, where did you work? Ruth, this is way too much. Seriously, somebody has noticed you. Blessed be the man who noticed you. And Ruth uh, uh, expressed the kindness of the Lord to Naomi. And, and, and Boaz so expressed kindness to Ruth that it was unmistakable. Even Naomi in all her bitterness could not miss it. She saw the results of the handfuls on purpose. And verse 19 records the first positive thing that that uh, Naomi says in the whole story. Um, and I don't have it up there. Whoops. Um, but, but she said, blessed be the one who took notice of you. Now Ruth had come under God's wings for refuge, for the rest that she forsook in the land of Moab. And God was giving that refuge to her. This is the work of the Lord. 
But Boaz became the hands and the feet of God to her. He was the human instrument. Boaz was used by God to express his kindness faithfully to Ruth and Naomi. What an incredible example for us to follow. God calls us to be like Boaz, to express the kindness of God to others. Now, what does that look like? Now, I bet none of us will be in fields gleaning the edges, or none of us will be foreign widows following after the reapers in any of the fields this summer. Or fall, I guess, whenever that happens. Thus, few of us will have an opportunity to show God's kindness in the exact similar manner that Ruth showed to Naomi. Few of us will have widows and fatherless following our combines in the field. And so it will not look exactly the same as we see in Ruth chapter 2. However, the ways in which we can manifest God's kindness are all around us. Really, you should start at home. If you love your neighbor as yourself... Who's your closest neighbor? They live in your house, all right? Your closest neighbors are at home, in your neighborhood. Those who live around you, start at home. What about at work? Those of you that go to work and, you know, there's people there that are lovely people, I'm sure. Some of them are probably very easy to get along with. Others of them, not so much, right? Uh, But God calls us to show the love of Christ to them. Certainly, This is something that should happen at church. We are all, all of us believers in Christ are in covenant with him. And what we're dealing with with Ruth and Naomi and Boaz are all people that are in covenant with God. And God is using them to express his covenant love to them. This harmonizes perfectly with what Jesus says must be our distinguishing characteristic as his disciples. John 13, 35, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so... This is the hesed of God. This is his loving kindness. And it is not so much a duty as it is a gratitude. He loved us this much. So we ought also to love one another with the same fervor. God never forsakes his kindness to those who trust in him. So trust in God's kindness and express God's kindness. And lastly, we should recognize God's kindness. Recognize God's kindness. See God's hand in the blessings that you receive, all of them. Know his sovereign care when you see it and when you experience it. And give credit, (coughs) excuse me, give credit where credit is due. Praise where praise is due. Recognize God's kindness. Now don't get antsy on me, we're almost done, but the clock says I have another hour to go. All right. So, take full, but in the hesed, the loving kindness of God, I will not take that full hour, all right? But know God's sovereign care when you see it and give credit where it's due. Recognize it. Ruth interrupted Naomi's raptures of joy to give her the name of the man she worked with that day. His name is Boaz. She slips into the conversation, trying to stifle the smiles chasing each other across her face. Naomi recognized that name, and she instantly saw God's sovereign work. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. Bitterness has melted away in the, in the fire of faith here. And... <clears throat> Naomi sees this kinsman redeemer, Boaz. She says, blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness. Who has not forsaken his kindness? Boaz or the Lord? The answer to that is yes. All right. But ultimately it is the Lord undergirding this whole operation. And Ruth or Naomi has just figured that out. And so the bitterness is gone and she sees the kinsman redeemer and she instantly understands that this man can marry Ruth, purchase her land and redeem them out of poverty and destitution. Excuse me. And uh, under the redeemer laws in Israel, even the name of the dead husband and son will live on. 
And all of this was orchestrated by the Lord as he made it so that Ruth just happened to go to the field that day where Boaz was. Naomi gives Ruth her glowing endorsement. She says, go after him. She (laughs) says that tacitly, uh, but she says in verse 21, Ruth the Moabitess said, he also said to me, you shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women and that people do not meet you in any other field. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest. And she dwelt with her mother-in-law. I want you to notice Naomi's response here. She is encouraging Ruth to do what Boaz instructed. And we're going to get more into, as we go through this uh, book, we're going to get more into the idea that Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. That's really going to come out. We're just seeing the beginning of that. Um, But she encourages Ruth to get involved here. And the good news she receives does not change um, her faith in the Lord. She is seeing the full picture that God is going to bless or that he may bless. She she doesn't know 100%, but she knows that something has happened, but she does not become presumptuous. They, Ruth and Naomi, just simply obey. They simply take what God is giving and follow his lead. You know, there is a sanctifying effect to recognizing God's kindness and seeing his sovereign control and care for you. We find that in the New Testament in James chapter 1 and verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation nor shadow of turning. When we recognize the kindness of God, we begin to focus on the giver more than on the gifts. So the enjoyment that we get from the gifts that God gives... That becomes a spiritual sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. In other words, when I enjoy the thing that God has given me to the glory of God, I'm doing that, doing what he designed to do. Uh, Our our use of the gifts become our worship of God, and really we enjoy God through the gifts. And the gift never becomes a stumbling block that makes us become proud and arrogant and self-satisfied. It never becomes an idol in and of itself because the gift becomes a means, it becomes an an avenue through which we give praise and glory and adoration to God. Because God does not give gifts to no purpose. He has a design for your job and your paycheck. God has a design. For your good health, God has a design. For your children and your grandchildren that are a gift to you, God has a design. For your freedom and your house and your car and your boat, any good gift that you have was given by God for a purpose. And that purpose is not our own selfishness. It is not just pleasure in and of itself. That purpose of every gift, every kindness from God is to focus our eyes on the giver of the gift on God so that we may lift our voices in praise so that we may love and honor and glorify and walk with him even as we enjoy something so innocent as casting a line into the water hoping to hook the next big one that we can tell all our friends about right or the next big one that gets away either way even an afternoon spent or I guess a morning that's why you never catch anything a morning spent (laughs) On a cloudy day, catching fish can be done to the honor and glory of God and not become idolatry. God never forsakes his kindness to those who trust him. So trust in his kindness. Trust Christ as your Savior. Express God's kindness to others. He uses us as channels of his blessing and recognize God's kindness even as you enjoy the good gifts that he gives you. And to that last point, let's close with just a a mental exercise, a self-test, if you will. In your mind, just name some specific kindness that God has expressed in your life. Something you can say, this is God's gift to me. And think for a second, all right, have you you got it? Have Have you named it in your mind? Let's just take, don't name a bunch of them, just take one, all right? Um, I think you could probably name several, but just take one. Now ask yourself, What is God's purpose for that particular blessing 
in your life. Why did God give you that? And a second question, ask yourself this. Am I, with that gift, am I fulfilling that purpose? All right? And now, we could do that as a men mental exercise with all of the gifts that God gives me. Um, and so ask, what am I doing to fulfill this purpose of bringing glory and honor and worship to God? Not just publicly, but even out of my own heart as I enjoy the gifts God gives me. Do I enjoy them, even when no one is looking, to the glory of God? Blessed be the Lord, who does not forsake his kindness to us.